Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. My name is Deborah Cobray for the few that are here that are new and you don't know who I am. Jim and I started this church 26 years ago. We grew old here. We've raised our kids here and now our kids are preaching the gospel from these pulpits and 12 grandkids and one great grandchild later, we've, we've done some living. And we have been privileged to be a part of what God is doing in the Inland Empire. And when we got married so many years ago, almost 36 years ago, we've known each other for 37 years, God brought us here. He didn't bring us to a beautiful place. He brought us to this place. We came from Santa Barbara, so can you believe that? We must have really messed up for him to bring us from Santa Barbara to San Bernardino. I'm just messing with you. But God has taught Jim and I some things, and now we're in a new season of our lives. So if you didn't like what I did tonight with the songs and stuff, just get over it. Please just get over it. We really do need to get over ourselves and get over each other. And we need to actually crack a smile and start to enjoy life. And so, Father, I thank you for tonight as we open the word, open our hearts. So we open our eyes, Father, show us the kingdom. Show us Jesus. Help us to be the people that you want and need us to be in this hour. We thank you and give you praise. Amen. So I want to teach tonight a little lesson that Jim and I have been living and we have lived. And it's nothing new, but it is a wonderful, wonderful word. Because the just shall live by faith. There's no other way you're going to live by faith. You're going to raise your kids by faith. You're going to work by faith. You're going to have your jobs and, and your businesses by faith. There's nothing in this life that you're going to do without faith. And I teach the kingdom of God class and Christology in the Bible college. And I've developed a little, a little module of the kingdom of God. Because I operate in systems. I was an economics student in college. And so I, I see... In the kingdom, I see systems. I see government. I see law. I see economics. You see, God's a king. He's the only king. He's the great king, and he has a kingdom. And in this kingdom, that which brings the invisible to the visible world, so I call this the economic system of God, moving his goods and services from heaven to earth, is faith. The just shall live by it. We're going to study it in Hebrews chapter 11. But there's something about faith, and there, my husband has taught us, and he's taught me, that there is something that accompanies faith, and there's something that faith resides with, like the wet with the water. It's the proof of faith, and it's called rest. Now, when you're believing God for something, and you've launched out, and you've started to believe God, and you've read the Word of God, and all of a sudden, faith begins to grow in your heart, and you begin to realize what a good God He is, that God's for us and not against us. The God actually wants us to be successful. He's given us the power to succeed. That's what the blessing means. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Blessing means the power to succeed. God didn't make you to be a failure. God made you to be a success. And when you begin to operate in the kingdom and you begin to realize that you're a new creation in Christ and that Jesus actually came to this planet to show and tell. He put on humanity. He became the last Adam and he walked through this earth experience with us, showing us what real humanity looks like. What it looks like and what we're supposed to be. And so if you really want to see what God can do with your life, and if you really want to change and you really want to step into more, how many believe that there's more to life than what you're living right now? How sad, because only a few of you raised your hands. How many of you believe that there's more to life than what you are experiencing and living right now? Let me see your hands. I hope every hand goes up because you've, you've not reached the ultimate of what God has for you. God has an amazing life for you and I. And in this life, it's going to take faith to walk through it and to walk in it. And in faith, there's something that accompanies it, like I just said, and it's called rest. R-E-S-T. And in the book of Hebrews... If you go there with me, and we've been here, I think we were there, oh, I don't know how many years ago, because we're in the book of Hebrews. I think we were here about three years ago. Chapter 4. Chapter 3 describes how the children of Israel missed the promised land. They missed the inheritance. 
They missed all that God had for them because of disobedience and unbelief. And it starts in verse 1 in chapter 4. And it says, Therefore, since a promise of entering his rest, since there remains a promise of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they heard the word of God, but they didn't mix it with faith, and so it didn't do them any good at all. You see, there are those of you right now in this auditorium, and you're not listening to me. You're here putting in time. But the words are just going right past you because you're daydreaming somewhere else. So you're hearing a message that can be life-changing to you, but you're not listening. And that's what the Hebrews did. They came out of Egypt as slaves. They came out of Egypt, the land of not enough. They came out of that land where they were badly treated, where they were nothing and they were nobodies. And God delivered them with a mighty hand of deliverance. And he took them into the wilderness, which was only supposed to be a short period of time. The land of just enough, the wilderness, so that they could learn how to trust God for their everyday needs. And then God was bringing them from Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land, which he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God was choosing the generation that he delivered to be the ones that would fulfill the promise of God and bring forth the plan of God into the earth. You see, you and I have a responsibility in this generation to bring forth God's plan for this generation. And we can either do it or we cannot do it. Now in chapter 3 it says that they didn't do it. When they went in to take the promised land, they said the giants are there, we can't do it, they're bigger than we are. There was only two, Caleb and Joshua, that believed that they could take the promised land. And so God had to take that generation and he wiped them out after 40 years. They wandered 40 years needlessly until their children grew up and then their children were the generation that went into the promised land and miraculously took the ground and the promise that God had given to Abraham over 460 years before. I don't want to miss my destiny, do you? And so God's talking about this in chapter 4. And he says there remains a rest. There's a rest. There's a rest of faith. There's something that happens. Faith has an accompanying place and a secret place where we are to live and stay and dwell. And my husband puts it like this. The proof of faith is God's rest. He's not talking about a Sabbath. He's not talking about a day. He's talking about a place where you and I can live as we operate in faith and believe God for the promises of God. Now, in every promise of God, just like the children of Israel, there was a giant in front of the promise. And so you are believing God, I'm believing God. We are walking this life of faith out with him. And all of a sudden there are delays. There are interruptions. There are adverse circumstances. There's all of these things that are coming into our life to stop what God has said we are to do. And I call it, it's the place between the amen when you pray and believe God and say, so be it, because amen means I believe it, so be it, and the hallelujah which means I got it, there is the journey of faith. And that's why we've been in Hebrews chapter 10, for you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So you are believing God, but there are giants in front of the promise, and there are many things in our lives that the enemy wants to steal, because if he can get our faith, he can get our destiny. Now, Israel didn't enter into destiny because they were disobedient. They didn't believe. But God doesn't believe that of you and I. So there's this amazing rest that God says we can live in as we are operating in that place between the amen and the hallelujah, that place of walking out your faith. Are you with me? And this is what he says. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith and those who heard it, for we who have believed do enter the rest. As he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the earth, the world, God had already prepared victory for them, but they were too afraid and too disobedient to go in and take it. So God in his wrath said, You'll not enter. You'll not get it. I'll give it to another generation. There remains, verse 9, Therefore a rest for the people of God, that's you and me, for he who has entered his rest, God's rest, 
has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. They fail to enter the rest, that secret place of God. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand, Psalm 91. You see, there's a place in God. Even though there's giants, even though there's interruptions, even though there's adverse circumstances, even though everything in your world says, no, it's not going to happen, it can't be done, it's impossible, God says, if you will follow me, you'll find a place in me where there is rest, now, what is God's rest? Well, I looked it up. Let me just say this to you. The rest of God was it. He's already finished the work. What does that mean? My life has already been finished. He's in eternity. I have but to walk into it and walk it out. The end is already finished and accomplished. Victory is already mine, but I have to walk it out on earth time. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The rest of God says that we believe and therefore rest accompanies us. That rest incorporates peace, ease, and the ability to relax. It's the relief from the effort and the stress of everyday life. Mm, let me say that again. The rest that God's giving us in this walk of faith, in this walk of walking out what he's told us to do and be, is peace, ease, and the ability to relax. It's the relief from the effort and the stress of everyday life. God wants to gather us into that secret place with him. He knows we're going to fight the battles. He knows there's giants. But you see, in that place of faith, there's a secret place there where there is relief and peace and there is ease. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and learn from me. And you will find rest for your souls. For I am meek and lowly of heart. In other words, God's got a system of operation that I have to step into in my faith walk. Or I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to be striving. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be uptight. I'm going to be saying, where are you, God? Because the enemy wants to get me off of my faith so that he can absolutely shipwreck the destiny that God has for me like the children of Israel. Are you with me? So what is this rest? Well, I've done a little acronym tonight, just four little things in the next 20 minutes, we're gonna go through them fast. So it's R-E-S-T. Four things that I'm gonna have to do to enter into the rest because it says be diligent therefore to enter into this rest. So let me read you what it says in the Amplified. It says in the Amplified in verse chapter four, verse Nine, it says, so then there is still awaiting a full and complete Sabbath rest reserved for the true people of God. That's you and me. I'm not talking about a day. I'm talking about a place. For he who has once entered God's rest also has ceased from the weariness and pain of human labors. You see, sooner or later, I have to realize that I can only go so far in my ability and my human ability, and it's going to have to take the supernatural to get this job done. My labor can only go so far, but then it's got to kick in God, the favor of God, the supernatural work of God, the plan of God has got to kick in and it's got to get done. Are you with me? God doesn't let me off the hook from doing my part, but I can't do his part. I cannot do what God can do, and he will not do what I must do. So he says, let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter the rest of God. To know and experience it for ourselves. So he says, be zealous, exert yourself, and strive diligently. So here's this oxymoron. He says, you gotta, you gotta enter the rest, which means you gotta stop working. But then he says, but you gotta be diligent. You gotta strive and be earnest, and you gotta press in. So that means that there are some things that I'm gonna have to be savvy about if I'm gonna get this faith walk done and accomplished with the plan of God for my life. I have to be diligent and I have to strive. Are you with me? So I'm gonna give you four things. R E S T. Are you ready? So here's the first one. R. I have got to refuse to worry. Refuse to worry. Matthew chapter 6, 
Verse 31 and 34, Jesus said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, here's the thing about worry. Worry is the opposite force of hope. Hope is confident expectation that something good is going to happen. Worry is dreadful anticipation that something horrible is going to happen. So I've got hope, which is confident expectation, or I've got worry, which is dreadful anticipation. You see, there's two forces working here. There's the force of faith in the kingdom of God, and there's the force of fear in the kingdom of Satan. Satan operates his kingdom through fear. God operates his kingdom through faith. Faith is a substance of things. Faith is a substance of things. Faith is a substance of things. Fear is a substance of things you've worried about. It's opposite hope. It's negative hope. God's given us the ability to image. We see in images. So when I hope, confident expectation, I hear the promise of God. I have something in my spirit. I say, God, this is what we want to do. We've checked it out with you. We're believing you. We've released our faith in it. Now, Father, we are in this for the long haul. We are standing in faith. And yet here comes worry. Now, sometimes we think that worry is stress and anxiety, but worry is not always that way. It's, it's the opposite force of hope. It's negative hope. It's painting a negative picture. I have been watching my parents grow old. My mom and my dad are 88 and 89. We just said goodbye to Ellen's mom. She was 96. We've watched them grow old and we've watched them diminish. And we've looked at them and in our minds we've said, is that going to be us? You see, it's given us an image. It's given us a picture of old age. And yet the word of God says, he satisfies my mouth with good things and renews my youth as the eagle. So if I want to stay in this negative hope worry, and the images of those things are going to color my life, then I'm all of a sudden going to begin to lose hope, lose faith, and before you know it, you're depressed. You see, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. We see through our own lens of life. From the heart, man sees. And everything is about perspective, how you see it. Here's a picture. I've shown you this picture before. Look at this picture. Some of you are going to see a beautiful woman looking with a hat on. Some of you are going to see an old lady with a big nose. Some of you are going to see both. How many of you see the young woman? How many of you see the old woman? How many of you can see both? You see, that picture is perspective. You can look at the same thing and you can see a beautiful woman or you can look at that and you can see an old lady with a big nose. Perspective. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You see, God came to show us what life can be like. Jesus came to bring us the kingdom. He came to bring us the miraculous. He came to take us out of the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of God and for us to walk out this life in faith, in the supernatural, bringing the plan of God to pass. But if my perspective, if my life is colored by my old nature and what my natural eyes are seeing, then I'm not going to be able to believe God for what's in front of me because in every promise of God, there will be a giant in front of it to steal it from you. Are you with me? Therefore, I've got to refuse worry. I've got to refuse dreadful anticipation. I've got to refuse those images that come up and say, you're going to be just like your mother. No, I'm not my mother. I'm Debbie Cobray. I'm not Lori Larson. My mother's an awesome woman of God, and she's not her mother. You see, we can, we can damn ourselves with our own thoughts. We can say, I'm not educated, so I can't accomplish anything. We can say, maybe I'm an illegal immigrant, so therefore I'm afraid and I'm intimidated and I'll never be anything here. But you see, that's not what God says. 
God says that I'm to have hope. I'm to believe as a man thinks in his heart so easy. The limit on our lives is on the inside of our hearts. Our hearts hold our borders and our boundaries. In Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. That word issues is borders and boundaries. As you see in your heart, what you have in your heart is what you will have in your life. And if you see the old woman and no hope, and that's worry, by the way. It's negative faith. Maybe you don't feel like you're worried or that you're stressed out, but what are your images? What are the images on the inside of your future? What are you seeing from your heart into your future? Are you seeing what your life says about you right now? Or what your parents were? Or what society says? Are you beginning to feed your spirit with the word of God and faith? Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And are you beginning to transfer those worry images into hope images? And see that beautiful woman and say, God, you can do this because you love me. And you've done so much for me. And it's your will that I be blessed. Where is your heart? So God says, if you're going to walk this walk of faith with me, Deb, and you're going to take these giants out, you're going to accomplish the will of God, you're going to have to refuse worry. E, I'm going to have to learn, E, this is R-E-S-T, to enjoy the day. I cannot give my power away. What does that mean, enjoy the day? Well, it means that you and I were made by God in his image, and we were made to be joyful. We were made to see the glass half full and not half empty. We were made to look up and see God, and see God in everything, everywhere, and to see our victorious Savior, and to realize that we have the favor of God, and the promises of God, and the mercies of God, and the goodness of God, and that we are actually to be lighthearted and actually enjoy the day. Now sometimes life gets serious and life gets hard and before you know it your giggle's gone. You're not laughing anymore. Everything's serious and everything gets very, very tight and you're like a rubber band that's stretched so far you're about to snap. But you see God says something about joy. First of all in Nehemiah 8.10 God said the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of who? Who? Did he say the joy of your husband? Did he say the joy of your job? How about the joy of your kids? The joy of your church? The joy of your looks? The joy of your talent? He said the joy of the Lord is my strength. So when I fix my eyes on my God, on the king and the kingdom, there comes into my spirit being a supernatural force of power. And yet that power is so easily given away every day. Somebody looks at us the wrong way or is rude to us or knocks us off in the freeway, gives us, you know, the, the sign, and instantly our joy is gone. Right? Do you know, every time I allow that to happen in my life, I am releasing and giving away power. And I am fighting a battle I was never meant to fight. And I'm weary and worn out over absolutely nothing. You see, if you're going to fight a battle, save your energies for the real enemy, who is Satan and his hordes. It's not flesh and blood. It's darkness. And so God says, Deb, you're going to have to learn to laugh again. Laughter is medicine. Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart does good, like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. In the message it says, A cheerful disposition is good for your health. Gloom and doom leave you bone tired. In this world of stress and anxiety and all that is wrapped up in our 21st century culture, it is robbing us and stealing and taking the power of God away from us because the joy of the Lord is my strength. So God says, you're going to have to learn how to laugh because laughter is medicine. And if you've forgotten how to laugh, then tonight the E part of this little acronym 
R-E-S-T, is to learn how to get back into enjoying the moments of your life and the days of your life. You know, you used to be, when you were in high school, you used to dance like crazy. We were crazy kids, weren't we? Stupid, crazy kids. Now we're all grown up and dignified. How boring is that? I tried to get us loose a little bit, and some of you just thought, oh, God, please shut up and let's just get on with the word. We are so stiff that we've forgotten how to have fun. And when we can't enjoy and have fun and laugh, it actually causes stress and so many other things to pile up on us, and God didn't make our bodies to handle that. He made our bodies to actually react to his presence and to have power and strength when we fix our minds on him and we laugh. You know, sometimes you got to laugh at yourself. You can do the stupidest things. I was with my brother in Washington, and I, my mom and dad live up in Washington. They live at my brother's ranch. And so my brother's a year older than I. I was, I was absolutely convinced that my brother's mission in life was to kill me. When I was, he was a year older than me, I was three, he was four, and I knew he was going to kill me. I knew he was. And so my brother was always, he teased me, he was merciless with me, he made me who I am today, kind of a tough old lady. So I'm out there with my brother, I love my brother, he's an amazing man. And we had to go to the grocery store, and he's got this white truck, and I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it, because I don't really pay a lot of attention to vehicles. But I knew it was white, and it was a, a four-seater truck. And we went to the store, and he wanted to go into this gun shop, and he wanted to actually buy a gun and I had to go to the grocery store and get some groceries for that night so it's raining because it always rains in Washington and so I was in the grocery store he was in the gun shop they were right next to each other of course it's Washington and there we are and I'm I've got the groceries and I run out to the truck thinking he's gonna be there and I ran out to the truck and there he was sitting in the truck and, and the doors are locked and he's on the phone and it's raining I'm soaking wet I am pounding on the windshield going, I'm thinking okay come on I'm a 62 year old woman and you're a 63-year-old man, it's no longer, this is not funny. Open the door, I'm getting wet. Get off the phone and open the door, pounding on the window. Suddenly, he had a hat on, he turns and he looks at me, and it's not my brother. It's a complete stranger who's talking to his wife. He lowers the window and he says, ma'am, can I help you? At that point, I wanted the earth to swallow me up. And as I was looking towards the gun shop, there is my brother with his hands like this, watching the whole thing cracking up. <laughs> Do you think I was embarrassed? Do you think I now know, need to learn what kind of truck my brother really drives? But you see, if I didn't laugh about that, I'd be embarrassed and I'd be, it'd be stupid. But you see, life is funny. We do stupid things. And instead of being uptight about it, let's laugh about it. Sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves because we're the biggest fools of all. But who have we got to impress anyway except God? And you know, sometimes just that childlike lightheartedness of not caring anymore and just enjoying being in your own skin, enjoying being human on the planet, Enjoying being with crazy people. Oh, listen, you are all crazy in here. <laughs> Let's just settle that right now. We are all a little crazy, a little bipolar. We got two personalities, the old nature and the new nature. We're all a little blonde on the inside. We are. We're human. And God delights in us. And he says, laugh. It's medicine. It's medicine to you. So you got to learn, and I've got to learn, that laughter is good. Laughter relaxes the whole body. Did you know this is scientifically proved? And you know what? If I only get through two of these tonight, are you all right with that? Since I took up so much time trying to get us to have fun, which I'm not sure worked very well. Let me tell you about all the tests they've done on laughter, and they've done a lot. Laughter has long been propounded in medicine as good medicine. A hearty laugh is a form of internal jogging. It exercises the lungs and stimulates the circulatory system. Physicians have noted that laughter acts as an anesthetic by distracting the patient's attention from pain, by reducing tension, by changing the patient's expectations, and by increasing the patient's endorphins and production of endorphins by 556%. And endorphins are natural painkillers. Laughter relaxes the whole body. 
Laughter boosts the immo immune system. Laughter decreases stress hormones and increases immune cells and infection-fighting antibodies, thus improving your resistance to disease. So if you are one of those people that can laugh a lot, you're probably healthier than most people. Laughter triggers the release of endorphins, the body's natural feel-good chemicals. Endorphins promote an overall sense of well-being and can even temporarily relieve pain. You don't have to get stoned. You don't have to get drunk. All you have to do is laugh. And it'll actually relieve the pain and increase your feeling of well-being. Laughter protects the heart. Laughter improves the function of blood vessels and increases blood flow, which can help protect you against a heart attack and cardiovascular problems. Listen, they've done so many tests on laughter. They found that Alzheimer's and dementia patients, when they could put them in an atmosphere of humor and good-naturedness, and they could watch videos, even though they didn't understand them, suddenly their memories increased 20% more than if they hadn't watched them. When God says, a merry heart is medicine, he knows what this world brings us. And he says, if you're going to get into that secret place with me, you're going to have to refuse to worry and recognize worry as negative faith and get rid of it, cast it down. You're going to have to learn how to enjoy your day. Don't give your power away. Don't let yourself have be a short-fused, angry person, but actually begin to laugh when people upset you. When somebody really bugs you, when somebody's mean to you, then you know what? Just determine that you're going to be so nice to them that it's going to make them crazy. <laughs> and have a good laugh. Let's, I, I think I can finish. You ready? S. R-E-S-T. I am going to have to learn how to shake off my cares. First Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you. You are going, and I am going to get frustrated. You are going, and I am going to have cares that come on in this faith walk when you are delayed, when nothing is happening, when it seems like it's not possible, when God doesn't seem like he's really there, when nobody's talking in heaven, seems like it's got a brass ceiling. You will have the opportunity to be frustrated, to be angry, to be all kinds of things. And if you and I don't learn to shake it off and cast it on God, we're going to keep it. Which means you've got to have a talk with God all the time. He is bigger than your venting and your frustration. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that you take a walk with God and tell him exactly how you're feeling and what's going on in your life. And as you begin to throw it on him and just say, here it is. I'm frustrated. I don't like this. I'm not a happy camper, or whatever it is you need to say, and you begin to toss it to him and cast that care on him, he'll take it. He'll get rid of it, and all of a sudden, your heart's going to be clean. Now, there was a man, his name was Paul, and Paul was on a missionary journey, and he was in a storm on a ship. Now, one of the things you never want to do is be Paul's friend and go on a missionary journey with Paul because you're going to end up wet in the ocean because every time he took a ship, he had a shipwreck. And so... He has been in this shipwreck, and he told them, listen, guys, we shouldn't be sailing. An angel appeared to me, said there's going to be a storm. Let's don't go. But you see, he was under guard by the centurion, and, this, and nobody listened to him. And so off they went into this massive storm, and as a result of it, they didn't eat for 14 days. They were locked up into this enormous storm, like a typhoon, and they were tossed to and fro, and they were completely blown off course. They were on their way to Rome, and they were completely blown off course, and they headed towards Malta, this island that they were not scheduled to go on. And as the storm begins to clear, and as Paul prays for them and says there'll be no loss of life, there was 276 people on that boat. Paul said, no one is going to die, but you're going to have to do what I say. And as they began to push that ship towards the shore of Malta, where the two seas were, were meeting, the ship broke up, and there they were able to get off of that ship and swim to shore, or they were able to hang on to pieces of wood and be rescued and not one person drowned or died. You can read this in Acts chapter 28. So they've had a very rough time. They are not in Rome. The ship is completely destroyed. They are very wet. It is raining and they are on this strange island that they were not supposed to be at. And the 
natives of that island greet them and they make them a big fire. And as Paul is gathering sticks for the fire, a poisonous viper grabs his wrist and the natives step back and they look at him and you can read this in Acts 28. They say, well, surely he's going to die now. He must be a murderer because he survived the crash. He survived the shipwreck, but now he's been bitten by a viper. And they were waiting for him to blow up and die because it was poisonous. What did Paul do? He shook it off into the fire and nothing happened. He shook it off and nothing happened. He shook it off and nothing happened. You see, when a poisonous snake wants to come in after you've already been through the storm, after you've already been blown off course, after you are already wet and tired and because of you, everybody else is alive, but nobody appreciates it. And then there's just one more thing that's got to happen in your life. And here comes a snake, that rotten snake, and he's trying to take you out. You know what you're going to have to do? Like Paul, you're going to have to just shake it into the fire, cast your care on God, and watch and see what God does because God had a plan. God took Paul on that island, and there was the head guy on the island. His name was, I don't know what his name was, P-U-B-L-I-S, Publis. His father was sick. Paul went to that house. He healed his father. It was a miracle. And the island brought every sick person in that island to Paul, and he healed them all. He stayed there three months and evangelized that island. So when we are not delivered from the storm in our walk of faith, but we are delivered in the storm and through the storm. It's because God's got a plan that wasn't on our agenda. And if we will keep our cool and refuse to worry and we'll enjoy the moments of our lives and we will shake off the frustrations and the problems, then God can do what he needs to do and take us on this kingdom purpose that he's walking us on. And the last one now tonight is T. So we've seen R. We've got to refuse to worry. See, E, we've got to learn how to laugh again and enjoy the moments and the days, not take ourselves so seriously. We've got to learn how to shake off our cares. And the last one, the last one tonight is we are going to have to T, talk the word. I'm going to have to talk to myself all the time. Now, you may want to do that when nobody's around because they already think you're crazy. But I'm going to have to tell my soul all day long what God has said about my life because my soul wants to tell me what it sees and it says in Psalm 42 11 why are you cast down O my soul and why are you disquieted within me the psalmist is talking to his soul he is having a soul talk he is having a self talk you see, there's a lot of people that want to talk into your life and tell you what you're not, tell you what's wrong with you, tell you how it can never happen, how you can never be this, how this is never going to be. You're too old, you're too young, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too white, you're too black, you're too Hispanic, you're too Asian, you are too whatever. And God says, you're going to have to talk to your soul. And you're going to have to say to your soul, why are you cast down? What, soul? Debbie, why are you depressed? What's wrong with you, girl? Do you know who you are? Do you know that you are a daughter of the king? You are not your mother. You are not your father. You're not your sisters. You're not your brothers. You are your own unique being, and God has already operated with destiny in your life. Now, soul, knock it off. I'm going to knock you out. Let's talk the talk that God talks. Let's speak the word of God. Let's speak those things that are not as if they were. Let's say what we believe, not what we see. Because we can say what we have or we can have what we say. <laughs> Death and life is in the power of our tongues. And we can be our worst enemy. And you can get frustrated. Remember I said you're going to have to cast, shake off the care? Because that care is going to come on you. It's going to come. It, that's part of the walk. You're human. You're in a battle. Pain's going to come on you. Discouragement's going to come on you. Disappointment's going to come on you. Sorrow's going to come on you. Everything that can happen to you is going to come on you. And if you and I don't learn to shake it off and begin to speak life to ourselves, because sometimes there's nobody else to speak life to you. 
If you're waiting for somebody to pat you on the back, or if you're waiting for self-pity to sit there and tell you how wonderful you are, you're going to wait until the cows come home. And self-pity is a lying spirit, and it will tell you that nobody understands you. But God says, knock it off. I'm going to knock you upside the head. Get up. Stand up. Be a man. Be a woman. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. Get up. Stand up. Act like a man. Act like a woman of God. And go do what I've told you to do. So, shut us thou up us. We are going to say what God says. And if you have to do that 500 times a day, like I said, I don't recommend that you do this in front of everyone. They might lock you up. But you get alone and you speak to yourself. God says, if you will refuse to worry, if you'll enjoy the days and learn to laugh again, it's a beautiful world I've given you. If you will learn how to shake off the cares and give them to me, you will learn to talk the talk, talk the word, talk the word, talk the word to yourself. If nobody else wants to hear it, and they're not going to want to hear it. What, you think the world wants to hear this? Half of you aren't even listening. And this is life changing to you. It's life changing. If you did those four things, you'd begin to see your giants being taken out and your promises coming into your life. Some of you are fighting sickness, disease, family curses. Some of you are fighting poverty and that poverty mentality. You just never see your way out of it because you think you deserve it instead of seeing yourself successful and that your father is not broke and he's not mad if you prosper. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God wants to do more with your life than you can imagine. So let's refuse worry. It's negative faith. Cast it down. Let's learn how to laugh. Enjoy the moments. Shake off the cares. And talk the word. We'll see the rest of faith in our lives. God's a good God. You know, when you have a baby shower, you send out an invitation. When God had a baby shower, he sent out a galaxy and a star. Can you imagine the calculations, the mathematical calculations, and how long it took to get those light rays all the way to earth at just the right time? That's God. He's the star breather, and he's the creator of heaven and earth. He is magnificent. He is absolutely omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. He's wonderful, and he loves us, and he loved us so much that he wasn't willing to do heaven without us. He didn't make us for hell. He made us for heaven. But there's only one way to get to God's heaven. It's not our way. It's not what the world says. It's not what our culture says. I know that we're told and we're taught that all roads lead to heaven, but that's not what God says. It's God's heaven, and we go to heaven his way, not ours. And God said that you must be born again, that if you're going to get to my heaven and you're going to come spend eternity with me, I made you in my image. I loved you enough to die for you. I loved you enough to come and walk through the human experience, go to a cross, I lay my life down for you and I pick it up for you. He was resurrected and raised from the dead because he was all God and all man. And he says, all we have to do is look to that cross and believe that he is the son of God and he did what he said he was going to do and surrender our hearts and lives to him. And all of a sudden, the way is open to us and we become new creations. We become born again, something brand new. There was a great preacher in London. His name was Spurgeon. And Spurgeon had the largest church in London at the turn of the 19th century. And there was great unrest in England at that time. And there was a, the Industrial Revolution was taking place and communism was coming in. And there was a man that was heckling him when he was giving an altar call. And he says, oh, you Christians, don't you know that communism is the answer? Why my religion, communism can put a new coat on every man. And without skipping a beat, Spurgeon said, well, the man that I know and the one that I serve can put a new man in every coat. And that's exactly what God does. You see, you and I were born into sin. You were born with it, I was born with it. There was nothing we could do about it. We were born into death, separation from God. God knew that we couldn't save ourselves. And he knew the only way that we could come to him was if he came as a man, went through the human experience, 
took our place and died for us. And because he's God, he took the keys of death and hell and he was raised. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is alive, resurrected, and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But I can't get to God's heaven my way. I have to get there his way. And Jesus said, you must be born again. So what does that mean, born again? It means simply this, that I surrender my life to him. I remember so many years ago, you're looking at a 64-year-old grandmother and great-grandmother. To look at me now, you'd think I'm whatever. You didn't see me when I was in my early 20s, when I was on drugs and I was married to a drug dealer. You don't know the life that I led. You don't know what I experienced. You only see me now, but you see, I see all the way back then. And when I met the living God and when I found out that I couldn't change me, but he could, and that I didn't have to change and be this perfect woman to come into a church and to accept him. But that all I had to do was surrender my life to him. And when I surrendered my life, he then could take me and change me from the inside out. And that's what this Christianity is all about. It's about surrendering your life. Letting him be your savior. Because you can't save yourself. And Lord. And Lord means boss. It means boss. It means, Lord, it's no longer going to be my way. It's going to be your way. I may not understand it. I may not get it. But God, I know it's true. I know it's right. And I want to serve you for the rest of my days. And tonight, if you're in this room and you have never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, God brought you here tonight for this, for destiny, to change you, to change your life because he loves you. He's not in shock over your life. He's not mad at you. He knows you can't save yourself. And tonight, through this little grandma, he's inviting you to come. Surrender all of your heart and all of your life to him. Doesn't mean that you have to make yourself perfect because you can't. But it does mean that you have to receive the gift of salvation because he's already given it. Now you have to receive it. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. If you've been a rascal like I was, I'm really talking to you. And if you backslid and you served God and you found yourself just so far away from him and you're here tonight, you're not here by chance. God wants you to come. Get right with him. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to count to three. I'm going to bang on this pulpit like that. And I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands all together. There's not a lot of us in here tonight. Probably most of you are saved, but not all of you. There are some of you in here that God brought to this very point, and he has a divine destiny for you, but you've got to make the choice. He can't make it for you. He's done all he can do now. It's your turn to say, yes, I believe. I want to surrender. I want to give my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. So all over this auditorium, I'm just going to count to three. We'll do it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high in the family rooms. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody over? Oh, I see that hand. I see that hand. I know there's at least five more hands. I see that hand. I know that God brought you here tonight by divine appointment. Maybe you've never heard a woman preach, or maybe you've never heard a message like this. Maybe you didn't understand any of it. But tonight, he brought you here for this. He is knocking on the door of your heart. You don't have tomorrow, but you have tonight. Anybody else need to get right with God, need to surrender their lives to God? It's your night tonight. Today is the day of salvation. Now is your appointed time. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I saw about 10 hands go up. We're going to stand because we're out of time. You've been great. We're not that much out of time. We have time for this. If you raised your hand or you didn't and you know you should have, and how do you know you should have? Because you know in your heart of hearts you're here tonight for this, but you're too embarrassed. And don't let embarrassment stop you from receiving Jesus Christ. He was stripped naked on a cross and he died for us. We can at least say yes in a friendly, wonderful place like this. People that want you to do this. People that are believing for you. We prayed for you to do this. So we're going to stand. 
If you raised your hand or you didn't and you should have, I want you to grab your purse, grab your Bible, grab a friend, whoever you came with, and I want you to slip out of the aisles and let's get to this altar and we're going to get right with God quickly and tonight. So quickly come. Quickly come. Now is the time. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus into your heart. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. We can't walk an aisle in a safe church. How are you going to walk out those doors and live for Jesus Christ in a hostile world? And you. So let's get right with God tonight. Jesus, let's get right. Quickly come. Quickly come. To you. The reason that quickly I come. The reason that I there's nine of you. I know there's at least five more. I know it's Sunday night, and I know it's 7.35, and we're five minutes over. But we love you. Heaven loves you more. And I'm going to ask Elijah to sing this song one more time. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to slip out of your seat and get down here. Let's get right with God. Tonight is your time. God has brought you here for such a time as this. Quickly come. We'll give you one more moment. Jesus, I am believe. Quickly come. There's one in you. There's four more of you I know that are in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I can't make I you come. Breathe. But you know who you Jesus, are. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. Okay. You know, put a smile on your face because you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party, and it's yours. You know, I don't know why we're ashamed of this. Oh, my. Can you imagine the God of the universe hanging on a cross naked? bleeding and dying so that you could do this today. I walked an aisle at a Billy Graham crusade when I was 13 and then I walked it again when I was 26. What an incredible king we have. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed of responding to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. This is a miracle, and you are going to be born again and brand new creations in Christ. This is Pastor Joel, and if you will make a left turn right here, we're going to pray with you in a private prayer room, okay? So you are beautiful. Your angels are all having a party because they've worked very hard to keep you all alive, okay? So off you go. We're going to go pray with you. Beautiful. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. And go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. 
Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.